Hello and welcome to Nikolai's Genetics Lessons and in this video I'm going to talk about C-value paradox. Actually this is not a paradox anymore, but uh, in from the point of view of historical context it was a paradox uh, about 70 years ago when scientists uh, separated to two groups. Uh, one group said that DNA is a source of the heredity and source of information how to build uh, life and uh, source of all the instructions and the other group of scientists uh, were thinking that uh, it is too primitive only four bases and life uh, have to be more complex and have to be written on the uh, proteins or proteins how somehow have to be used and uh, basically at that time uh, scientists did uh, exactly what they are doing nowadays in physics uh, in uh, colliders, for example, first speeding atoms in uh, magnetic tubes, in magnetic field, and then colliding them. In a search of even smaller parts that atoms consist of. So, at the first uh, half of the 20th century, scientists, biologists, and genetists uh, were trying to find as much information about DNA, and they have found that, uh, for example, uh, DNA consists of four uh, base pairs, that is cytosine, that uh, base pairs with guanine, and they didn't know that, by the way, and adenine with base pairs with uh, thymine. Uh, what they have found? They have found that if we would have, for example, 20% of the cytosine, we also would have 20% of guanine, and the rest would be uh, 30% of adenine and 30% of thymine. So, uh, this information helped uh, Watson and Crick later to find that uh, DNA consists of two strands and uh, cytosine would be spare with guanine and adenine with thymine and this explains why we would have always the same uh, quantity of uh, say adenine and thymine, cytosine and guanine. And uh, also scientists at those times in 1940s they have found that all species uh, would differ in this CG or AT content. For example, humans has CG content that would be about 41 percent and also that give us that A T content would equal to uh, 59%. And if we would uh, say uh, also compare with different species, with different animals, uh, say with mice, we may find that the CG content would be say 45% and AT content would be say 55%. Uh, by the way, I know this data for humans, but this data I just uh, take for uh, comparison and these numbers are not exact. I'm not sure about uh, what we can find in mice, but I know that all the species and scientists also know at that time would have different CG content and AT content and just by looking at these numbers we can say, oh no, this is not human uh, genome this is mice genome and if for example we would have uh, uh, some other numbers like say 42 percent uh, that is CG content and 58 percent of AT content scientists uh, were able to say that uh, this ratio uh, is uh, not the same as uh, in human DNA but this is uh, ratios that can be found, say, in frogs. But uh, scientists didn't understood uh, all these ratios, why all species uh, have different uh, ratios and different DNA content. Uh, those, all the individuals that belong to this group, for example, if you uh, would measure CG content of any uh, human, you would find that uh, content would be as follows and uh, only 
uh, when we compare different uh, species, we would find that these ratios would be also different. And if DNA would be coded by uh, four bases, for example, one strand would be A, T, C, G, A, T, C, G. We expect that other strand also would be T, A, G, C, T, A, G, C. So we can expect that about 25% of the DNA would be adenine, 25% we expect it to be thymine, 25% we expect it to be cytosine, and 25% we expect it to be guanine. Why these numbers are not even? So why we do not get here 50% and 50% here? Why in other species we also do not get 50% and 50% here? And uh, explanation we only have been able to find in the 1970s of the last century when scientists have found that, that huge portions of our genome are non-coding sequence. For example, in humans only 2% of our genome is coding sequence that code for proteins and 98% is so-called non-coding sequence and at that time they call it uh, junk DNA because they didn't find any function for this DNA. But uh, nowadays we do not call this um, junk DNA anymore. We call this non-coding sequence. So sequence that doesn't code for building proteins. And uh, also this explains why such skews numbers we can find here. Because uh, introns do not code for the protein and uh, Intron sequences can be highly repetitive. For example, for many thousands of nucleotides, the sequence can be C, T, C, T, C, T, C, T, and so on. And on the other strand of the DNA, we would have a T, C, T, C, T, C, and T, C. So, uh, as you know, about 50% of our genome human genome consists of transposons and ancient viruses that is not functional anymore but uh, makes majority of our genome much more than coding sequence. Then uh, scientists of 1950s uh, also assumed that uh, our life uh, have to be represented like this triangle where uh, most primitive organisms have to be, from genetic point of view, have to be somewhere here. Somewhere here we should have uh, organism uh, that is like uh, salamandras, for example. And here we should have such organism like mammals. So uh, we expect that uh, genome size of uh, this organism have to be small and this organism have to have bigger size of the genome and this organism have to have higher size of the genome because we are more complex than for example bacteria and this is uh, such a way of thinking of course uh, makes sense and then scientists uh, started to um, compare genome sizes and they have found that some protist uh, that have to be somewhere here at the very beginning of the life, uh, if we would compare complexity, have genome size that is bigger than those of humans. And even some salamanders would have genome size bigger than humans. And many plants also have a size of the genome bigger than humans. More than that, they have found that even within the same group of species, uh, some of the species uh, can be different from the other ones, from genetic point of view, by the scale of uh, tens and hundreds and even thousands of times. So just imagine the same plant in the same uh, group of species may have a genome size, say, one billion um, base pairs. And another one, uh, we know that uh, in the same group of species, would have genome that would be 50 billion of base pairs. 
and that is about 15 times bigger than human genome. How it is possible? So they call this C-value paradox and didn't have explanation to it until in the second half of the century uh, scientists have found that uh, some plants, for example, can be uh, not only deployed but also can be triploid, so would have three sets of the uh, chromosomes instead of two and uh, you probably even use such plants every day, the uh, products, the fruits, for example, watermelons, that is seedless, or bananas, both uh, would be triploid. And many, many other fruits that doesn't have seeds probably would be triploid too. Some of them are triploid by uh, nature. Uh, it is natural state like uh, bananas. Those also, some bananas are deployed. But uh, most of them were uh, human creation. More than that, we also have some plants that is tetraploid, pentaploid, hexaploid, and even uh, decaploid like some strawberries. Polyploid plants usually grow a little bit slower, but uh, would grow uh, bigger, would have bigger leaves, would have bigger fruits. So nowadays uh, it is not a paradox anymore. Now we know that uh, some of the organism may have multiple sets of the uh, genome, so can be triploid, tetraploid, and so on. Plus, uh, in some organisms, uh, we also know that introns would make a majority of the genome, just like in us it makes 98%, but on the overall in bacteria it makes less than 1%. So this, there is a, such a trend that a more primitive organism uh, also would have a smaller size genome, but also there are many, many exclusions from this rule. So, uh, nowadays we know that uh, size of the genome doesn't reflect complexity of the genome itself. And nowadays uh, we can talk about C-value paradox only from the historical point of view, only in historical context. And this is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Please subscribe for my new videos that I post almost every day. Thumbs up if you like this video. Please write your comments, questions if you have any. Share this video with your classmates and see you in the next video. Goodbye.